This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. The United States asks some of the world's largest oil-consuming countries to release stockpiles to lower global energy prices. Our other headlines, big tech in more trouble. Now China cracks down on the big corporates with a new anti-monopoly body. The Turkish lira hits record lows as the central bank defies warnings to cut interest rates. And the EU says it will not negotiate with Belarus over the border migrant crisis with Poland. The Biden administration has asked some of the world's largest oil-consuming nations, including China, India and Japan, to consider releasing oil stockpiles in a coordinated effort to lower global energy prices. Our business correspondent, Juliet Mann, has been following the day's events. Juliet. Thanks very much, Jamie. Yes, well, when reports from White House discussions on those possible oil releases came out, West Texas and the global benchmark, Brent, slid to their lowest levels in nearly six weeks, Brent dropping below $80 a barrel. Now, crude prices have recovered, have been pretty flat for, for most of the day. But what we're looking at here is an unprecedented challenge to OPEC, the conglomerate of oil-producing countries, which has influenced oil prices for more or less five decades. Because even though coordinated strategic oil reserve releases have happened before, like you'll remember in 2011, during the war in OPEC member Libya, this time, President Biden seems to have got China on board, the world's biggest importer of crude oil. So what's going to happen next on energy markets? Let's talk to our correspondent, John Terrett, in New York. John, good to see you. Look, rising oil prices have really been getting on Biden's nerves. Um, is there real oh. economic substance to his plans here, or um, is it, this is just you know, political play? Yeah, hi there, Juliet. It's kind of difficult to say at this point, but I give you the background of all of this. Gas prices, or petrol prices, as they're known in Europe, Americans call it gas, of course, they're at a record high at the moment. They are up just under 50% in the last 12 months, standing at $3.40 per gallon at the moment. Americans buy their fuel by the gallon, not by the litre. And to be fair, that is from a very low base because, of course, the price of pretty much everything, and certainly crude oil, collapsed last year back in 2020 when we were at the height of the pandemic. Now, Biden's poll numbers are very, very low, even though he's just signed into law one of those trillion-dollar infrastructure packages. The latest approval ratings, remember he's only been in the job for about 10 months, have him at about 36 percent, and the disapproval ratings are 53 percent, so that's very, very bad. And, of course, it's because food and rent and clothing and the cost of automobiles and, of course, underlying it all, the subject we're talking about, crude oil is all going up massively compared to last year. And presidents always get blamed when inflation goes up, and they are blaming him right now. Now, today's move is that there is a report. We don't know for certain, but it's certainly widely reported that he has approached China and India and Japan, three other massive oil users, and asked them to dip into their country's reserves. And certainly here in America, he's under pressure to do exactly the same thing. Chuck Schumer, who is the majority leader in the Senate and the senior senator for the state of New York, was saying this only at the weekend. It was the lead story here in New York on the radio and on local television. He was saying, please, Mr. Biden, open up the country's reserves. The problem is, Juliet, that if he does that, and indeed if China and India do it too, it's only a very short-term solution because the reserves are there meant for a rainy day, meant for real economic problems facing a country. And it's a bit like dipping into your savings. If you want to just you know, buy something for your home and you haven't quite got the cash, you dip into your savings to pay for it. It's the same sort of thing. And ironically, right at this moment, at the White House, the Three Amigos Summit is taking place. Now, this is with the Prime Minister of Canada and also the President of Mexico. It's called the Three Amigos. And one of the key issues is going to be the abandonment of the Keystone Pipeline, which was pretty much the first thing that Biden did when he came into office. He cancelled it. And it would have taken oil all the way from the uh, sand 
oil fields in Alberta, Canada, all the way down to the big refineries. There are about five of them there in New Orleans on the Gulf. And Biden cancelled that. And he's being blamed now for hiking oil prices in part because he did that. Julia? So it doesn't seem that this will solve the supply issues then that have been pushing up energy prices. But, you know, but Biden, he can't control well, the price at pumps, can he? No. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is the dilemma for all presidents. I mean, all of them face this at some point in their tenure. I mean, he really can't. He, he cannot control the direction that oil goes up or goes down, but he will be blamed for it by the electorate, which is what's happening now. Now, already he's asked Saudi Arabia and the other major oil producers to pump more oil, and they've said no. That was the answer. So what can he do instead? Well, none of these are very appealing, but let me list them for you. First of all, he could ban all U.S. exports of oil to the rest of the world. That would be a huge move, and it would destabilize the oil industry globally, but he could do it. Some in Congress are asking him to sue the oil-producing nations. Well, that would take time. It wouldn't solve the issue immediately, and that's the real problem. He is, as of this moment, calling for a probe, an investigation, into the big oil major companies because he suspects that there may have been some illegal moves going on there regarding the oil price. A lot of people on Wall Street rubbish that to say that's just to deflect attention away from some of the bad things that are happening in this country at the moment. The problem is everything I've said he could do, but they are all of them terrible options. Now, the good yeah. news, I suppose it's good news, is that the oil production is still going up. Despite COP26, where you were last week, oil production generally is still going up. And therefore, given all the economic implications that we're seeing, oil prices are expected to stabilize in the middle of next year. But, you know, Julia, how ironic is it that at COP26 last week, they were all calling for, you know, less oil, to move away from oil. And yet right now, they're all calling for more oil. We need it now. And as you will know, because you covered COP26, you were there. I mean, this is one of the great problems with this whole issue. It's all very well to say we want to move away from coal and oil. It's very difficult to actually achieve it. Julia? Especially when you're thinking about the next election and votes, real, real crowd exactly. places and things exactly. like that. John Terrett right. in New York. Exactly. And that's what all politicians do, right? It really is. Well, let's see what the um, energy markets do next. Yeah. John Terrett in New York, thank you. Juliet, thank you very much, and John Terrett too. Now the rest of the day's news, and big tech has been under fire around the world, from the United States to Europe, because of its huge influence and lack of regulation. Now China is inaugurating a new antitrust body. The National Anti-Monopoly Bureau has been set up as China continues reining in monopolistic behavior of big companies. Beijing says it wants to create a fair and competitive environment. Rich Turin is the author of Cashless, China's Digital Currency Revolution. I asked him what the new body means for big corporates. The antitrust issues all tie into the Internet. Yes, there are other industries, but it's mostly about the tech front and ending the tech Wild West that had been in the decade prior in China. And the end goal is to drive innovation in China. China has seen what happened in the U.S. with regard to the Internet and the monopolies, and what they wanted to do was to ensure that all Internet players or tech companies have an equal footing in that they can all drive further innovation in the tech space in China. It's a, a global trend right now, as, as you suggest. Big tech companies, we know all the names, Facebook, uh, Google, uh, running into regulatory headwinds pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, what will be the future of these huge companies that until now have been too big to fail? They're still going to be too big to fail, but they are going to be controlled. And here, the big thing is China is not trying to break up or otherwise um, hinder its tech companies. What it's fundamentally asking, asking them to do is to play fair. And um, what the regulator is going to do is to basically look at their practices and decide which ones are, are essentially not playing fair in the market. So it's good for all of the small to mid-tier 
tech companies who are looking at this and saying, hey, this is going to give us breathing room. This is going to give us the room to innovate. Big tech is not going to like this, but the small to medium tech is going to look at this and see this as a bureau that's going to look out for them and help them along. Rich, which sectors and, uh, and companies do you think are most vulnerable to action here? And what does it mean for the investors? Um, let's take the investment for, from domestic first. Domestic investors are absolutely plugged into this. They know what's going on. It's nothing new to them. They're, they're at the point where they're very much aware of what's going on with anti-monopoly, and they have adjusted their investments uh, accordingly. Foreign investors are going to look at this as a signal that the um, regulatory issues that we've seen over the last year are going to continue. So it's not over. Um, China is going to continue to um, look and examine its, its uh, big techs and to ensure that they behave and play well. So foreign investors are likely to be a little bit skittish, but they're not leaving. China investors, even those from abroad aren't going away, but they do have to be aware that this is a new reality where tech doesn't get, always get what it wants. And that's a change for everyone. China's debt-ridden property developer Evergrande is selling its entire stake in a streaming company to raise money. With more than $300 billion in liabilities, Evergrande is the world's most indebted real estate developer and has been struggling to meet interest payments on loans. It's selling its $273 million stake in Heng Ten Network Group ahead of two more payment deadlines in December. Shares in the Indian digital payment startup Paytm fell by more than 25% on its first day of trading after the country's biggest ever initial public offering. Indians use the platform for daily services like buying groceries and paying household bills. Paytm had raised $2.5 billion in India's largest IPO. But investors voiced concerns about the company's lack of profits. The global economy is expected to grow by 6% this year. That's according to Barclays. Recovery has been slow and uneven since the pandemic, but Barclays says it's still moving at a faster pace compared with the past decade. It expects price rises to slow down in the second half of next year as inflation and labor supply bottlenecks ease. Starbucks has partnered with Amazon to open a coffee shop without cashiers using Amazon Go technology. The store in New York lets customers grab a coffee without waiting to pay in the usual way. Instead, their Amazon accounts are billed for their drinks. The Turkish lira has again fallen to record lows on world markets after Turkey's central bank voted to cut interest rates. The currency, which has lost a third of its value so far this year, is now trading at just under 11 to the dollar. It comes as President Erdogan renewed his calls for a cheaper money supply to boost the country's ailing economy. Well, Tien's Louise Greenwood has been following the story for us. So, Louise, was this latest cut expected? Well, Robin, the last cut to rates in October saw 200 basis points shaved off the cost of borrowing. That was about double what the markets had expected. So another aggressive cut to interest rates hasn't come as a complete surprise. Also on Wednesday, President Erdogan gave a speech to his party colleagues in which he vowed to fight interest rates to the very end. Now, his views on interest are pretty well known by now. He blames higher borrowing costs for choking growth, stifling innovation, and he's again suggested that a cheaper money supply could boost small firms, allowing them to invest in their businesses and hire more staff. Well, the markets don't seem to agree with him, and as we've seen, the lira's taken another plunge, falling to just a shade under 11 to the dollar, 12.5 to the euro, 14.5 to pound sterling, and it's now the worst performing emerging market currency this year. And this rate-cutting drive by Turkey's central bank appears to be completely out of step with other emerging market economies like Brazil, like Russia, that are taking quite aggressive steps to raise borrowing costs to call inflation, which we know is rising globally as lockdown conditions in much of the world do ease. And Louise, what effect will this have on the rising cost of living? Well, the official figures show consumer price inflation running at over 20 percent. The bulk of that's being driven by higher oil prices, higher energy costs impacting on food, transport, on housing. Now, that 20 percent figure is four times the central bank's target. But even this data has been attacked by independent groups in Turkey who claim that the true rise in the cost of living could be much higher. 
Now, certainly inflation has become the chief concern for Turkey's main business groups. They've been warning for some time that small firms in particular that have until now been absorbing extra costs rather than lose trade are running out of wriggle space because raw material costs are going up so fast. And what's Turkey's opposition had to say about this? Well, the political response, you might well imagine, has been pretty swift and severe. The main opposition Republican People's Party, the CHP, it's claimed that the central bank can no longer claim to be a functioning independent body of state, that it's taking its orders directly from the president himself. The party's call for the elections, which are due to be held in 2023, to be brought forward. And meanwhile, for many, the question is no longer whether interest rate policy will change under the AKP. There's simply no sign of that. Instead, they're now asking whether the AKP may be seeking other measures to control the money markets. And there are signs of this already. There are new restrictions underway on exchanging cash in foreign exchange bureau. We've seen curbs on cryptocurrency trading, which has been booming in Turkey until quite recently. And speculation is rife on social media that capital controls on bank accounts for those seeking to reduce their exposure to the lira may be the next step. But so far, that's something that the AKP is continuing to deny. Louise, thank you very much indeed. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, new wave, new laws. Germany's parliament is forced to approve new legislation to fight a fourth wave of coronavirus. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more just got to be careful here with some gunshot. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. The world has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. This week on Razor, the great whale mystery. Sustainable food of the future. And locking up plastic and carbon by putting it into our roads. I just don't want my daughters to live in a in a world where there's more plastics in our oceans than fish themselves. It just shouldn't be that way. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. Just a reminder for you that CGTN is available to watch for free on all the major digital platforms, on Smart TV or online on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube and Dailymotion, CGTN.com and the CGTN app, and in the UK, 24 hours a day on Freeview. Over 400 Iraqi nationals have boarded flights at Minsk airport to return to Baghdad. The majority of migrants camped on the Polish border are understood to be Iraqi Kurds from the north of the country. The regional KRG government in Erbil is appealing for its citizens to come home, claiming they have been deceived by the authorities in Belarus. Let's talk now to our correspondent Laith Al Haidar in Baghdad. So, Laith, what more do we know about the efforts being made to bring Iraqis back home? 
Well, actually, we're uh, like a plane is on the way to Erbil in the beginning uh, to uh, send uh, the, most of the immigrants are Kurdish, send them uh, to uh, uh, Baghdad, uh, Erbil International Airport first, and the rest will go to uh, Baghdad International Airport. So uh, the, uh, most of them are Kurdish. Uh, as we said before, lack of services, lack of jobs, that's what makes those people leave in the first place. Uh, the delegation has been formed uh, from uh, both uh, uh, embassies in uh, Moscow and, and uh, uh, Warsaw, uh, trying to find a solution for this problem, uh, making delegations to be in touch with those uh, in the borders and uh, facilitate uh, all the needs uh, they, uh, for these Iraqis to return voluntarily and uh, as well as the, the Prime Minister is also uh, sending uh, some uh, human aid for those who are in need. Uh, the plane is not, uh, didn't uh, reach uh, the uh, Erbil International uh, Airport yet. Uh, and uh, mo most of the uh, media delegations are waiting. Uh, the relatives of those uh, migrants also waiting till now. And uh, also we have uh, some news of uh, the, the corpses uh, and uh, the people who died in the borders. Uh, we have no information about uh, their corpses, if they are being, going to be retrieved uh, by the same plane or not. Some said uh, these uh, bodies may be uh, uh, buried uh, in the same place uh, next to the borders. Yes. Faith El Haida in Baghdad, thank you very much. Well, meanwhile, the EU says it will not negotiate with Belarus over the migrant crisis at the border with Poland. That's despite an offer from the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, to repatriate 5,000 refugees and migrants, but only if the EU agrees to uh, take in another 2,000. Our correspondent, Alyosha Malenkovich, is at the uh, Polish capital, Warsaw. Alyosha, there's clearly a, a, a flurry of diplomatic activity now to try and fix this crisis. Uh, what more can you tell us? Uh, of course, Jamie, what we learned maybe minutes ago is that the press conference of Interior Minister of Poland together uh, with the uh, Interior Minister of Germany, Mr. Hans Seehofer, uh, just uh, was finished. And according to the local news reports, uh, Hans Seehofer said that uh, Germany is firmly behind Poland in this current issue, and he denied any reports that Germany is willing and ready to receive any of the migrants currently stopped or stuck at the border between Belarus and Poland because there were some uh, rumors, uh, particularly among migrants, that Germany will uh, at least some of them accept and taken through the humanitarian corridor over Poland. So uh, uh, Horst Zehofer that firmly denied that. What is also interesting is that we learned that uh, Angela Merkel, a uh, German chancellor, has spoken to a uh, local Polish Prime Minister about the same situation and of course Polish Prime Minister was interested to hear the, is there any movements any any progress in discussion between Angela Merkel and Alexander Lukashenko Belarusian uh, president and uh, according to the same news reports Angela Merkel said that any kind of solution or any kind of agreement reached with Belarusian Belarusian side will be in accordance with the Polish desires, in accordance with the Polish interest as well. So Germany is firmly sticking behind Poland in this case as well. Alyosha Malenkovic in Warsaw, thank you very much. Germany's parliament has approved new laws to try and slow down a new wave of coronavirus cases threatening to overwhelm hospitals. Measures include having to prove full vaccination, recovery or a negative test to enter workplaces and use public transport. There will also be strict penalties of up to five years in prison for forging COVID certificates. Well, let's talk to our correspondent Trent Murray in Berlin. Trent, uh, what exactly are these new laws designed to do? 
Well, Jamie, I think the passing of these new laws really underscores the growing sense of unease at this emergency, which is really unfolding across Germany now. The laws will essentially bolster the existing regulations around the coronavirus and empower regions and cities to enact new measures. Some of the headline measures uh, which have really been taken note of here, especially by the German press, uh, is restrictions on travelling on public transport. So you'll have to now show some form of vaccination or, or negative test result, particularly for long-haul journeys on things like the Deutsche Bahn high-speed train. Also, testing measures now going into offices as well. Employers are being asked to work closer with health authorities to make sure people coming into the office do get a test, but where possible to put back in place working from home. This all, of course, comes as the country does see a major resurgence of COVID-19. A number of hospitals are saying that they are not only having to cancel elective surgeries, but also that they're running out of space in their ICUs. In fact, in some hospitals, patients are now being airlifted to neighbouring European countries for help. So, uh, as I say, a growing sense of unease at what is happening. Lawmakers today are looking to try and get a handle on the situation. Trent, the pandemic has been raging for ages. The timing is interesting, isn't it? Why have these new uh, laws been passed now? Well, I think firstly, it's because of, uh, of necessity. The current state of emergency in Germany was due to expire on the 25th of November. Obviously, when that date was set several months ago, the German government at the time thought the country would be out of the woods by now, but that clearly hasn't happened. And so they had to make a decision on whether to extend the law they now have into next year. But I also think there is political pressure, both on the outgoing government of Angela Merkel and the new incoming one of likely next Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz to really do more because the way things stand, the health authorities say the German health system could really struggle over the winter. And so with cases now at record highs, uh, it seems that they finally are moving in that direction. But we'll have to wait and see whether they are willing to maybe go further if this doesn't stem the flow. Of course, in neighbouring Austria, they have with that lockdown for unvaccinated people. No indications will go that far yet, uh, but certainly they are saying here that all options do remain on the table. Trent Murray in Berlin. Thank you very much. Eastern Europe is also facing a surge in COVID-19 infections, especially in countries where vaccination rates are poor. Our correspondent Linda Kennedy reports from the Hungarian capital Budapest, where daily cases have reached the highest level since March. New restrictions against unvaccinated people have been announced in Slovakia and also in the Czech Republic, which is not going to allow those who have not yet had vaccinations into restaurants, hotels and to use other services. It comes on the back of record daily totals in some Eastern European countries. In Hungary today, there was more than 10,700 new infections that were reported. In Poland, more than 24,800. In the Czech Republic, 14,000 just over were reported on Wednesday. And in Austria, the number of new infections reached more than 15,000. Here in Hungary, there are calls for bans on mass events and also for mask wearing to be made mandatory in closed spaces. So far, there is just a ban in terms of people going on public transport if they are not wearing a face mask. The levels of vaccination come into this quite significantly in the Czech Republic. One of the main drivers for their new restrictions is that the vaccination level there is quite low, just 57.6%. In Hungary, the level is about 66%. They are having a vaccination action week, which will start next Monday. And that is to try to encourage people to take not just the first vaccination, but also the second and the third. How this is likely to take itself forward over the next few months with Christmas approaching? Well, in Austria, with those high case numbers today, there has been talk in the hardest hit provinces of a full lockdown, not just targeting the unvaccinated as they are with their 2G rules in Austria at the moment. And there's pressure from those hardest hit provinces for a national lockdown. That's coming from uh, far right provinces, though, who are vaccine critical or their leaders are. 
So whether or not the strong words that we're hearing from Hungary's doctors saying that hospitals are drowning in patients and if there is not restrictions, then there is going to be wartime conditions in hospitals. Well, with words like that and the prediction of hospitals like that, it's not clear how much longer Hungary can resist placing restrictions on its population. Linda Kennedy, CGTN, Budapest. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, homemade chips. The EU says it'll solve the global semiconductor shortage by producing them in Europe. It's the first day in Germany that vaccination centers like this one are offering a third jab. There are fears there could be a fifth wave of COVID-19 cases. Market watchers have a keen eye on infection rates. Safety and efficacy of COVID-19 shots. France closed schools in the first lockdown in spring last year. France has been a leader is in vaccinating youngsters. If a spike necessitates another lockdown, Italy is now close to reaching its target of immunizing 80% of the population over the age of 12. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at death. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with global business, only on CGTS. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. The United States asks some of the world's largest oil-consuming countries to release stockpiles to lower global energy prices. Our other headlines, big tech in more trouble. Now China cracks down on the big corporates with a new anti-monopoly body. And the EU says it won't negotiate with Belarus over the border migrant crisis with Poland. Well, days after hosting COP26, the United Nations Climate Conference in Glasgow, the UK government has withdrawn from building a major part of the country's public transport infrastructure. The government has scrapped part of a planned high-speed rail network intended to keep millions of cars off the road. The eastern leg of the HS2 linking England's Midlands and Leeds will no longer be built. Instead, the government's transport secretary has announced plans to upgrade a line already in place. Grant Shapp says the $129 billion building programme will deliver faster journeys and increase rail capacity 10 years earlier than originally planned. Well, let's talk to Henry Murison, the director of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. Uh, Henry, welcome. The plans for uh, this high-speed network were years and years out of date. Uh, Zoom, like, things like this, have revolutionized business meetings since the pandemic. This is the right thing to do, isn't it? I'm afraid it's not. And I think to those observers and those watching the program who are not familiar with the north of England, you have to remember that this is a place 
of around 16, 17 million people uh, with significant economic potential. And when Jim O'Neill wrote the city's growth commission, he was very clear that bringing together the northern cities as part of the northern powerhouse was not just dependent on transport connectivity, but also on digital connectivity. So there is the real issue that if you compare us to, say, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, a city region that's obviously much larger, there you have a large bridge and a railway that provide connectivity from one end to the other. In the north of England, we have railways that were left to us by the Victorians 150 years ago and uh, some congested motorways. But people do not commute between our major city regions. People do not take jobs here in Leeds Station, in, in the city of Leeds, from places such as uh, Liverpool. People do not take jobs in Newcastle from if they live in cities like Sheffield. And in most comparable European regions, uh, Rhine Ruhr is a, probably a comparable uh, industrial base. You see a lot more labour mobility, and that labour mobility, often in, in manufacturing, is in sectors where you do require physical co-presence. So uh, it's not all factory jobs do require people to be at their machine or uh, working their 3D printer, but many of them do. And I think that uh, what that may apply to London, the South East, and you look at the levels of commuter traffic on the London railways, and it's very low. Passenger traffic in the north is going back up faster, and people here are largely dependent on cars. Uh, and if we want to be able to unlock capacity on the road network to avoid our cities becoming more and more congested. We need to get people out of their cars as well as uh, electrification. So I think that there's a very clear case for investment and the lines that have not been developed today, there's no full line between Leeds and Manchester, only as far as a town called Marston. We've not seen the investment between Leeds and Sheffield that would have brought HS2 here to Leeds and would have given better connectivity to cities in the East Midlands like Nottingham, currently more than two hours away by train in Birmingham. So it's a real missed opportunity for the UK government. And I would argue that having made significant commitments in the past, that we've seen tens of billions knocked off commitments towards levelling up, which is the Prime Minister's main domestic priority here in the UK. For an international audience uh, watching this programme, not familiar perhaps with the cities uh, that you're talking about, I wonder, after COP26, what is the environmental message that the UK government has sent out from this decision today? I'm afraid I'm struggling to hear you. I'm just going to uh, try once again, Henry. I'm going to ask you what okay. this decision means in terms of the government's environmental message. The UK government was hosting COP26 in Glasgow just uh, a few days away. And this decision now not to proceed with this huge public sector, public transport uh, project, what message does that send out about the UK government's green and environmental intentions? I think it, it sends a very bad message. And one of the, the, the key decisions made today was to not electrify a railway line yet between Hull and here where I'm standing and, and sitting talking to you in Leeds. The, the real challenge with that is we've got huge volumes of freight currently coming in by road from uh, down at Felixstowe, a very congested uh, trading route. Um, and actually the Humber ports and across to Liverpool could bring a lot more freight in and out of the UK more efficiently and without relying on trucks through an electrified line. But that electrified line, which would have given greater capacity, uh, the opportunity to run more freight across the Pennines, there isn't really a credible current freight route directly east to west across the Pennines that's got enough capacity on it, would have made a huge difference here in the north of England. And I'm really concerned that having not electrified the line to Hull, that the ability to make the most of our port assets, the, the north of England is uniquely lucky to have Manchester Airport, our global long haul hub airport, which is on the HS2 network, is on the Northern Powers Rail network. So although we've got great connectivity for our aviation assets, when it comes to passenger traffic, it's really easy now to get from, uh, particularly from places like Liverpool, uh, but also from here in Leeds, it will be a lot easier to get to Manchester Airport. That's a real benefit of what's been announced today. But the freight capacity, the opportunity to decarbonise and get trucks off our major motorways and to allow for more freight movements more efficiently is a real missed opportunity. And we've seen during the pandemic in the UK, unprecedented growth of freight where there's been spare capacity what we need to do in the UK is create more capacity for freight. We have a particularly constrained rail network, having not built enough new lines when those such as the French have done it uh, much more assiduously. And in the UK, we've got a lot of catching up to do if we're going to make the most of rail as a way to decarbonise the freight sector. One of the hardest things in terms of electrification, hydrogen, to roll out. It's very difficult to get our lorry fleets off diesel. And in the meantime, we could be relying on rail freight to help us meet our decarbonisation goals. Henry Murison in Leeds, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. What is the world going to do to solve the global shortage of semiconductors? 
The EU says it's considering easing its rules over state aid to allow chips to be made by member states in Europe. Semiconductors are used in everything from washing machines to new cars and boosting their production has become a top priority for the EU. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent Giles Gibson in Brussels. So Giles, chips to be made in Europe, what more can you tell us? Well, Margrethe Vestager, who is the European Commissioner for Competition, uh, said a few hours ago that state aid could be allowed uh, for companies in what she described as the semiconductor ecosystem. Uh, state aid is generally prohibited here in the EU unless uh, there are very specific uh, circumstances attached. Uh, she also, Margrethe Vestager, moved to head off concerns about uh, this state aid potentially undermining the free market here in the European Union. Uh, take a listen to what she had to say. There are strong safeguards to make sure that such aid is necessary, ap appropriate, proportionate, and of course to make sure that undue competition distortion is limited. Benefits must be shared widely and, widely and without discrimination uh, across the European economy. Now, some of the world's largest semiconductor manufacturers are generally based in Asia. I'm thinking places like uh, Taiwan and South Korea. But the EU is now working very hard to try to catch up over the next decade or so. Uh, there is a new piece of legislation that's been put forward by the European Commission called the European Chips Act. Uh, and the aim here is to produce around 30 percent uh, of global production of semiconductors here in the EU uh, by the time we get to 2030. So Giles, how much damage is this ongoing chip shortage doing to businesses in the EU? Well, Robin, as Margrethe Vestager was making this announcement here in Brussels, we had uh, another announcement from the European Automobile Manufacturers Association uh, about sales figures saying that they had had the worst October on record and pointing the finger very squarely at this shortage of chips that's been going on uh, for several months now. Uh, they are saying that there were just over 660,000 units, uh, cars sold in Europe uh, over the course of October this year, which is way down uh, on the same time period last year. Uh, this is really adding up to questions about whether the EU is acting fast enough here. They're talking about potentially loosening uh, restrictions on state aid for semiconductor companies. Uh, that European Chips Act that I was talking about is probably only going to be approved in 2022 at the earliest. Uh, meanwhile, car manufacturers here in Europe are saying that they cannot get hold of enough semiconductors and they need a, a much faster supply uh, as soon as possible. Giles Gibson in Brussels. Thank you. At least 15 people have been killed by the security forces in Sudan during demonstrations against military rule. Dozens of others were injured as soldiers fired live rounds and tear gas at protesters in Khartoum and Omdurman. Wednesday's violence was the deadliest since the military seized power last month. India's government has temporarily barred trucks from entering the capital, New Delhi, to control hazardous air pollution. Only trucks carrying essential supplies will be admitted. New Delhi has been smothered in a toxic haze since the start of the month. Schools remain closed as more children are being admitted to hospital with breathing problems. A state of emergency has been declared in Canada's western province of British Columbia after a storm cut road and rail links. The Canadian armed forces have been sent to move stranded residents to safety. One woman was killed in a landslide and two people are missing. The authorities warned that the number of casualties could still rise further. So how much would you pay to watch football? English football's Premier League is due to decide which US broadcaster will show games from next year until 2028. The bidding war between Viacom CBS, ESPN and NBC could top $2 billion. The current contract held by NBC cost $1 billion in 2015. If it meets forecasts, the new deal will be the EPL's most lucrative TV rights deal ever. Well, let's talk now to Kieran Maguire, who joins us from Liverpool in the UK. So, Kieran, how desirable are these rights? What kind of money can broadcasting Premier League games generate for a network? 
Well, many of the networks are now working on a subscription basis. And what they found is that uh, football rights, uh, especially those uh, which, which are non-domestic rights, which are the Premier League, are the ones which are the most sought after. They are far more popular than La Liga, than the Bundesliga, uh, Liga, uh, uh, and so on. Um, and therefore, what the, the broadcasters are finding is that if they are trying to stop people cutting the cable, then having a, a roster which includes the Premier League is essential. It also attracts a, a younger demographic with, uh, with more potential wealth than some of the established sports in the US. And last time these rights went for one billion, and this time they're forecast to top two. So why are they likely to go for more? Well, it's because that they've simply delivered in terms of viewing figures uh, for, for NBC, uh, that they, they use their, their Peacock service for, uh, for, for their football rights. Um, what they have seen is that the, uh, the MLS is popular. Uh, the, the, the Mexican Football League is uh, especially popular because uh, the US has a large Hispanic population. But the Premier League is perhaps the most universal. Um, and because ultimately it's eyeballs that the, the networks are selling, the Premier League delivers those eyeballs. Um, and uh, that, that's caused the, uh, the competing broadcasters to bid up the price. Well, you say that uh, the, the, US, the British English, rather, Premier League delivers eyeballs. But, uh, you know, football's huge in England. Does that popularity of clubs like Manchester United, let's say, really translate to the United States? Very much so. You've only got to look at Manchester United when they uh, visit uh, the United States in terms of a pre-season tour to, to see the popularity of the club. Uh, all of the matches are sold out and, and they're able to fill stadiums which have 80 to 100,000 capacity with ease. Promoters are desperate to get the likes of Manchester United, Liverpool and Chelsea to, to appear. Um, and this is very lucrative for the clubs themselves, but it also further enhances the brand because fans of those clubs uh, can now see the player, can see their players and heroes live. Um, and, and that further reinforces the popularity when those matches are subsequently broadcast during the Premier League season. Kieran Maguire from the University of Liverpool, thanks very much indeed for joining us today. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. We find out if these Chinese-made robots are the answer to Brexit staff shortages in the UK hospitality sector. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing, and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe. There can be few more precious cargoes to transport than blood or plasma to patients desperately waiting for life-saving treatment. In Hungary, a new service to move blood supplies has just got underway. The scheme, known as Blood Bikes, sees volunteers on call day and night to deliver blood and plasma to hospitals. As Penelope Liersch reports, the riders can cover hundreds of kilometres a day. Inside this bag is a life-saving delivery. Blood products desperately needed to help a newborn baby. 
with lights and sirens on, the precious cargo is rushed through the streets of Budapest to a regional hospital. A high-speed trip all in a day's work for Hungary's blood bike volunteers. It's an acute care service, so how busy we are really varies a lot. Sometimes we do many trips a day and sometimes none at all. In our first year of operation, we had over 650 call-outs and drove 183,000 kilometres. Started by a group of friends in August 2020, the program has grown from five volunteers to 22. They work around the clock to respond whenever a call from the blood bank comes in. Previously, supplies were delivered by blood bank employees in cars, but the volunteers have boosted manpower and speed by travelling on two wheels. What motivates us is the fact that we can easily ride a few hundred kilometres on a motorbike but if we have a goal that adds to the experience, we really like riding our bikes. Even in the coldest weather, we prefer to ride rather than drive. With bases in Budapest and Debrecen, the blood bikers cover the entire country, although they use cars in poor weather. If we can keep this going, we have plans to launch in other parts of the country. We're already operating in another city. We would like to help in other places as well. There is a huge demand in eastern Hungary. It can be a dangerous job travelling at high speeds. The group post videos online to spread awareness around emergency vehicles in traffic and share safety tips. Blood bikes are not unique to Hungary. There are volunteer programs in Australia, Ireland and the UK. As well as transporting blood products, they also assist health systems in other ways, like delivering PPE during the pandemic. While the bikers volunteer their time, they rely on grants and donations to stay on the road. Calls for their deliveries are likely to reach new highs as COVID hospitalisations rise again. At the peak of the COVID pandemic in the spring of 2021, that's when we drove the most. There was a month when this one car alone covered 17,000 kilometres. We delivered a lot of plasma. The group aims to have bases linked with each of the five blood centres across Hungary to keep up with demand. Penelope Leish, CGTN, Budapest. Brexit and the pandemic has led to a well-publicised shortage of workers in the UK's hospitality sector. The official data suggests there are over one million job vacancies across bars, restaurants and hotels. One Chinese company hopes to help fill this gap with robots. Catherine Drew reports. Meet Bellabot, one of the latest employees at Gravity Southside Leisure Centre. It's being trained to deliver food from the kitchen to the restaurant area, carrying orders directly to the correct table. It's early days, but Bellabot and her two robot counterparts are proving useful. It will give us uh, the ability to, if we've got a smaller workforce due to not being able to get numbers, um, it will give us the opportunity to still run at maximum capacity by having the robots in place and being used. So they have a very cat face in here and you can touch the head They'll be say, to, to say something to avoid interaction with the customers. Shenzhen headquartered Pudu Robotics, which has grown to employ 2,500 people since 2016 already supplies robots to more than 60 countries, including some across Europe, but sees the UK market is holding great potential. Uh, we are into the UK market not, not that early, but I'll, I still uh, believe that the UK should be a large market in the future. The first reason is like our, our, our machines or robots can work in with the waiter and the waitress. The second thing is the labor shortage is always a, a a hot topic in the UK right now. Pudu Robotics' small team in the UK is set to expand as it responds to inquiries from cities across the country. The idea of using robots in the hospitality sector has been given a cautious welcome by British work unions. This is a service industry, so human contact and, and um, service skills are, are, are really important. But I think if, if new technology is used in a sensible way to make the jobs more interesting and, and easier and less labour intensive, then, then it, it could be a good thing. These robots are on something of a probationary period to see how they work best with their human colleagues. However, this entertainment company is confident they will become permanent members of staff 
both here and in other branches. Oh, thank you. We've been able to utilise staff in a different way. We've been able to remotely deliver the food to the tables um, and put a smile on people's face before they even start eating. They may be all metal, wires and chips, but these robots are being paid an hourly rate, with the money they earn going to a children's charity. So don't forget to tip your waitstaff. Catherine Drew, CGTN, London. The vegan food revolution is continuing to make inroads in Europe. Now one vegan food manufacturer is launching plant-based steaks in restaurants made meatier with the use of 3D printing. The Israeli startup Redefine Meat has used the digital process to recreate the texture of real beef, but only using plants. To see more, europe.cgtn.com. Two giant panda cubs in France have just been given their official names in a celebrity baptism. One is called Juan Lili, which translates to happy, while the other is called Yuan Doudou, which means chubby and cute. Uh, France's World Cup winning footballer Kalian Mbappé and China's Olympic diving gold medalist Jung Jia Se are becoming the honorary godparents to the two young bears. Ross Cullen reports. This is Beauval Zoo in central France, where 100 days ago, two panda cubs were born. Kylian Mbappe, the 22-year-old soccer superstar who won the World Cup with France in 2018, he's going to be one of them. And 17-year-old Zhang Chi, the Chinese diver who took home gold in the Tokyo Olympics earlier this year, she is going to be the other honorary godparent. The Cubs' parents came here in 2012, and that move really has boosted visitor numbers to this zoo. The year before the arrival of the giant pandas, 600,000 people came. This year, the zoo is hoping for 1.4 million people to come here, despite the pandemic. Giant pandas are vulnerable to the risk of extinction, according to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. They're native to China, and poaching and deforestation are the major threats to their existence. So that's why it's a cause for celebration when two new cubs are born. Ross Cullen, CGTN, Beauval Zoo, Central France. Roads have been closed on Australia's Christmas Island to help keep thousands of red crabs safe as they begin their annual migration. The crabs emerge from all over the island with the first rainfall of the wet season. They travel to the ocean to mate, creating a flame-red spectacle. From there, the male crabs trek back to their homes in the jungle, while the females stay behind in burrows to lay eggs. Each female crab can produce up to 100,000 eggs. It's a lot of crabs, isn't it? And the headlines again. The United States asks some of the world's largest oil-consuming countries to release stockpiles to lower global energy prices. Big tech in more trouble. Now China cracks down on the big corporates with a new anti-monopoly body. And the EU says it will not negotiate with Belarus over the border migrant crisis with Poland. Well, that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube and Dailymotion, cgtn.com and the CGTN app and in the UK on Freebie. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place from all of the team in London. It's goodbye. Goodbye.